I'll never forget one of my favorite jobs I'd ever had. Uh, I worked in construction and remodeling when I was church planting, and I loved it. Uh, there's something about tearing things apart and then making them new again. I love it. Uh, but my favorite job was actually working for uh, this homeowner named Jeff. Uh, so we went, through, went to the house, and he said, I want to change some things. I want to change the inside of the kitchen, uh, and I want to replace this and get some different appliances, and then I also want to change what's in the backyard. I want you to do some landscaping, some cement some work, and some uh, fencing. And we're like, yeah, of course. So we wrote up the bid. He looked at the bid and said, this is great. So we got started. Uh, about a week into it, uh, Jeff comes running outside. He looked like Doc from Back to the Future. His hair was just sticking up. And he said, what are you doing? My backyard looks a mess. I was like, oh, I don't know if you know who I am. I'm Marcus. Uh, I'm working on this job here. Uh, he's, like, he's like, I know, but I have company coming over, and my house looks a mess. Look at the kitchen. Come with me. So I walk into the kitchen, and he says, where are my cabinets? I was like, well, well we asked for a remodel, and so we're taking down the cabinets. Uh, where's my fridge? I said, oh, Jeff, uh, do you remember in that bid, uh, you asked for a new fridge, and so we had to get rid of the old one, actually. And he said, you know, I, I just can't believe that everything looks a mess, and I have people coming over. And so we sat down, and about two hours of conversation and explaining to him, explaining to him how construction works, uh, he, said, he said, I think I didn't realize what all would be necessary for this job. I didn't realize how long this would take. We're only a week in. And I said, well, Jeff, this job to transform your entire landscaping in the backyard and transform your kitchen is going to take at least a few weeks. So we shared with him, and then he finally realized that you have to strip down the cabinets if you're going to get rid of new, old cabinets to put in new ones. You had to get rid of the old fridge if you want to put the new fridge in there and get rid of the old appliances. You had to tear up the floor so you could put in the new tile. You had to tear down everything so you could rebuild everything up. The backyard looked a mess because it was going to be new. And a few weeks, about two months down the road, he said, I'm so thankful for this process. But for so many of us, when it comes to God transforming the inside of our lives, we say, uh, I want you to remodel, but leave the old stuff too. Don't do anything on the inside. I don't want you to change too much. I want to walk in your purpose, but kind of like, let me do it my way. He said, no, you saw, you saw the contract. You saw the bid. You saw, you saw the work. You saw how much it cost. Would you just say yes? Would you say more of you and less of me? God, you can take everything. Do whatever you want to do. But for many of us, when it comes to not only the renovation of our home, but the renovation of our hearts, we like to be guarded. It reminds me of the court case that happened in 2016, you can look this up, there was a restraining order between a man and God because he said, because he said God was messing up too much of his life. Uh, the court case was thrown out because the judge said he doesn't have jurisdiction over heaven. So uh, it was thrown out, but that's, that's so, so many of us. We say, God, do whatever you want to do, except for like there's some things I don't want you to touch. But as we talked about last week, God is good, and it's good for us to be near him. And if that's the case, when it comes to our theme verse for the series, it's in Christ we find out who we are and what we're living for. That means we focus on him. He's going to show us who we are, our identity, and it's going to impact our activity. Why does it matter that we focus on Christ and the work that he's doing in our lives and allow him to do it? Because we become whatever we look at. And God is shouting from the mountaintops, look at me. He's saying, just look at me, look at the work of my son, because your life will be transformed forever. We find our identity in, in God, and our character is in Christ. And, and you may be thinking, well, why is character important? Well, character is so important, because if you have the right attitude and the right character, when you come home from work, you have to remind yourselves, you're not just bringing a paycheck home, you're bringing you home. And sometimes, I am the problem. Well, no, work was just really tough. Nikki will say, no, babe, you're really tough. Oh, okay. A character matters, and we should look more and more like Christ. In fact, this is how the, the whole goal of Christ-like living means we should be conformed into the image of who he is. This process is called sanctification. Uh, we say yes to Jesus, that's salvation, and then after we, after we say yes to Jesus' salvation, he goes through the renovation of our heart, the transforming of our lives, and that's when we have to say, Lord, do what you will. Take everything if you have to. It's this process where we allow God to do what he wants to do, because he is the boss. And we don't give him rules and regulations. We say, do what you will. I want to walk in the purposes that you have for me. Do what you will. And if you don't know, we have to fully understand that God cares more about our character than he does our comfort. I'll say it again because it stings a little bit. God cares more about our character than he does our comfort. He's not here to pamper us. He's here to perfect us. Sometimes we just need to slow down and say, God, do what you will. 
And this is the perfect prescription for imperfect people. Raise your hand if you're an imperfect person. Too late. Some of y'all are still going too slow. Your hands should pop up. We all are imperfect people. We need a perfect design from a perfect designer who has a specific purpose and a calling that is unique for every single one of us to impact the world around us. We get this idea of being conformed to the image of of Christ directly out of Scripture in Romans chapter uh, 8, verse 28. Many of us know this passage. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We love that part. Yeah, everything's going to work out. Everything everything is terrible, but man, it's just going to work out. And then he goes on. He says, well, for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them Why? To become like his son. Make me more like Jesus. He chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. We talked last week that you are a child of God, a son, a daughter of God. You're not an only child. I know know we like to think we are. We get at everything. You're not the only child. And as we're not the only child, our process and our goal is to look more and more like Jesus. Because when we come home, we bring us with us. You go to the grocery store, you're not just bringing groceries back, you're bringing you. You have a conversation with someone, you carry that conversation with you, you walk back and you're like, you're not going to believe them. Nikki would look at me, I'm, I don't believe you right now. Character is important in our lives. In fact, one author would say it this way, when it comes to our character, good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you. Carve your name on hearts, not marble. This is why it matters, because the word character all throughout scripture, it actually comes from a Greek word that means tools for engraving. It literally means making a mark. That's what happens when we walk into a room or walk out of a room. People, I say this often, people are excited when we arrive, or they're excited when we leave. We get to decide which one it is. They're like, oh, so glad they're gone. I don't want to be that kind of person when I walk into the room. I want my character to be, Marcus, I'm glad you're here, because when I see you, I see a bit of Christ. Not all Christ, because you've still got some kinks to work out. I know, I'm working on it. But I want them to see Christ. We are image bearers. We are here to leave a mark. In fact, our vision here at New Break is to develop Christ-centered leaders who change their world. So I want to look at that idea of how we are to change the world around us, walking in our purpose, the unique calling and purposes that God has placed within us. How can we change our world? So how do we develop this kind of character that changes the world around us? The the defining characteristic of every single believer should be the character of Christ. That should be what's so different about you. And people will ask that question, what's so different about you? Your answer? Jesus. Not just, I'm actually, (laughs) the thing about me is I'm just better than you. (laughs) No, that's not it. And you're wrong, and so am I. The character of Christ is the thing that separates every single one of us from everyone else. That is the goal. If we would have the character of Christ in our lives, everything would be different. The goal of our lives is Christ-likeness. And if we, want, if we want to receive that, we have to be in Christ. We have to be in his word. And so today I want to look at a passage that talks about this dominant theme in Scripture, talking about being in Christ. It's in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, I've, I've shared the acronym with you after you get through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, my mother loves Jesus. That's how you can remember that one. Uh, then you have Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Then we go into go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. So we're going to be in Philippians today. So if you'd be in Philippians with us, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, what I love about Philippians is it's written to a group of people in this place called Philippi. Uh, Philippi is named after King Philip II. Uh, Philip II was actually Alexander the Great's father. So if you know history, just kind of place yourself in that historical moment right now. Paul and Silas go to Philippi and they're sharing the good news with people and things are happening and it's amazing. And then Paul is in prison because that's his second home. He's got a home away from home. Not like a home at the beach, it's just at the prison. Uh, And so he's writing from his prison cell. And he wants to write this letter of encouragement and gratitude and, and instruction. In fact, the book of Philippians would be considered by many theologians a manual of joy. And so he talks about the quality and the experience that we have in Christ and how it can change our entire perspective of our lives. So if you need joy in your life, which is every single one of us, go to the manual of joy, Philippians. So Philippians chapter two starts this way. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, we can pause there for a second. That word if 
uh, could be better translated since. It's, it's like a rhetorical question. It's like me saying, are we at new break today? You'd be like, yeah, we are. I don't know why you asked that question. That's what's happening in this right now. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, do we? I feel encouraged when I'm united with Christ. If any comfort from his love, I feel comforted in the love of Christ. If any common sharing in the spirit, yeah, when, when we do things together and we, we see that the spirit is moving in us, yeah, it's, it's amazing. If any tenderness and compassion, and he goes on, then make my joy complete. Paul is saying, I'm already ecstatic about how you are and how you live and how you love one another. And yeah, there's some arguments going on. We'll talk more about that later, but, but just make my joy complete. I'm in prison, and thank you for the love that you're sending me. I've said this before. Remember, the, the prisons then did not have like three meals, uh, you know, a nice bed to sleep in, uh, clothes to wear. You were placed in a room and hoping that someone would put some money on your books, for lack of better words. And so people would do that. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. See, Paul is saying if there is going to be this idea of character within us that could really propel us toward walking in our purpose, walking in this joy that God would have for us, if there is a spiritual quality of Christ, it would start with unity. And if that's the case, when it comes to everything around me, I need to allow unity to drive my decisions. When it comes to my purpose, let unity drive my decisions. If you're wondering what your purpose is, I promise you, God is not saying, I need you to be more divisive. He's not. No matter, no matter what your purpose may be, he's not going to be like, I just need you to go in there and just be really divisive, really mean, just put people down. Yeah, that's my purpose for you. That is never God's purpose for anyone. God is saying, let unity drive my decisions. This was the way Christ lived. God, I want to be more like you, more of you and less of me. Take everything, do whatever you want to do. And he says, so this is how we cure the disunity we see in the world today. In fact, he writes this. Now, notice this. The letters that we read all throughout Scripture, they were written and then given to someone, a messenger. This one was given to Epaphroditus. And then that messenger would go to the church and read it or have someone read it. So then they get to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, Paul writes some people's names. Could you imagine? Being like, oh, we got, we got a letter from Jesus today. Uh, hi, new break. <laughs> Love you. Um, I just want to talk about Brooks and Marcus real quick. You guys need to get it figured out. All right, but the kindness, that's what happened. Can you imagine being in that room? Can you imagine me just calling some people out? That's, that's, not, what, that's not what I'm here for. But that's what happens. He calls out the disunity that is happening in the church. He calls out two people, Iodia and Syntyche. And he's like, you two, get it figured out. You're messing it all up. But unity has to drive every single decision because when it doesn't, it begins to fracture some of our relationships. And I love how he starts this in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 1. He says, therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, he says, then make my joy complete. Uh, he goes through this list, these four spiritual realities, and then four spiritual qualities. It's what we would call in scripture, when you study scripture, it's called a chiasm. Uh, you know what a chiasm is, you just probably didn't know it was called one. Uh, when the going gets tough, the tough that's a chiasm. It's a word uh, where the beginning of the sentence is said one way, the rest of the sentence is completely said another way to actually get the point across. So that's what he's doing here. He says, so if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, make my joy complete. How? Well, being like-minded. Right? Did, did, you, did you see what he did there? If you have encouragement from being united, well, then be like-minded. Any comfort from his love? Well, then have the same love. Any common sharing of the Spirit? Well, be one in spirit. Any tenderness and compassion, be one in mind so that your heart is transformed forever. The spiritual qualities parallel the spiritual experiences. Imagine what this would look like in marriage. If you as a couple were like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, being one in mind, you'd be inseparable. No matter what came against your marriage, your family, nothing would tear you apart if you had this character of Christ, I promise you. So as you're saying, Marcus, I don't know what you've gone through. I'm speaking, as I shared last week, someone who's been through a divorce. I'm telling you, if this would have been in my heart, things would have looked different. If this would have been in the heart of my partner, things would have looked different. And let me tell you right now, 
I have the most amazing woman in the world. And come on, yeah, give her a hand. This is how we model our marriage. And, and I mean, there's times when things get messed up, but we come back to this. In fact, we, we value unity so much that we have a commitment to one another. We have a rule with one another that we don't talk bad about each other. You will never hear from me anything bad about my wife because she is perfect, okay? <laughs> you will also never hear anything bad about me because I'm imperfect and she doesn't want you all to know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But that's how our relationship is. That's how much I love that woman. That's how much she loves me. Imagine if that was how we functioned as a church. If you could go around any corner, if you could hide and you could hear people talking about you and all they had to say were good things. Not because you're perfect, but because we're of the same mind. We're one in spirit. We have the same love and we're like-minded. Right? If we could just say, oh man. And when I think about Laura, I think about her commitment and her humility. You don't even know her story and I won't even tell it. That is a powerful woman who is simply who she is and will lead worship even off the platform if she needed to. Imagine if that was the way we talked about people. Imagine if there was so much unity that people almost got sick of it. People do. People will be talking to me and I'll talk about my wife and like, you're always talking about your wife. I said, yep. And if I wasn't, there's a problem. <laughs> right? Don't know what else to tell you. Right? Imagine if that's how we talked about one another. Imagine if we spoke well about our church family. No more disunity. No matter what it is. And if you have a problem, follow Matthew 18. Go straight to them. But if that's how we functioned, having the same mind, same love, one spirit and one mind, this is walking your purpose. Imagine what it would look like in your workplace. If you talked well about other people, even the people that are talking ill of you, you're not gonna believe what they said. You hear what they said, oh wow. Well, I'm so glad that they're using their voice and feeling that they, they can be heard. Do you think it's true? Well, it doesn't sound true to me, but you know what? I'm so glad that they have a strong conviction. You're not going to say anything bad about them? Nope. Because that's not my place. Now, if I have a problem, I can go and confront them privately. But what if this was the experience that we experience in all of our relationships? I'm telling you, the world would not be able to stop you. It wouldn't. When it came to your purpose, if that's the kind of person you are, you wouldn't miss that promotion because you were too unifying. You know what? There's just something about you. You walk into a room and the whole office, they just get more excited and the productivity goes up. And, you know, we just, for that reason, we can't promote you. What? No, you walk into a room and the atmosphere begins to change. You must be walking your purpose as you're a CEO, CFO, stay-at-home parent, whatever it may be. You're walking your purpose in such a way that people are unifying around the fact that God is good and it's good to be near him and it's changing the way everyone views the world. For that reason, God promotes. That's how we should begin to live. And if you want to know what, what unity looks like, unity is what completes, disunity depletes. It's like, you know, when you're playing soccer, uh, I played soccer for 12 years, and as a little kid, talk about unity on a soccer team, the whole team just chases the ball. That's it, right? There could be a, probably a better way, but that's, that's unity. Everyone's just together. But disunity, disunity brings division. Unity brings connection. Now, when I think of disunity, I also think of soccer, uh, because I played soccer for 12 years, and as I said, and one of the games that I was playing, uh, we were at a pretty rundown field, and I went to go grab a ball that went out of bounds, grabbed the ball, threw the ball, and I started running. Felt a little weird, and someone from the other team says, what's wrong with your leg? Now, if someone playing a sport says that to you, something's wrong. So I looked down, I immediately fainted. Next time I wake up, I'm in a hospital room. The doctor is, uh, or, sorry, my mom is on the phone. Told, the doctor told my mom to call the coach and see if the rest of my skin from my leg was found on the fence. You see, there was this nice rusty fence that was sticking out like this, and as I went to grab the ball, it was so sharp that I didn't even feel it. It took a chunk of skin, I'm not exaggerating, about that big. So left there was just, you know, the insides, the goodness of the Lord, right? Just exposed. And the doctor said, for us to sew this up, we're going to need some extra skin. We need something to get figured out. So my mom called the coach. The coach was able to go out and find it, and they brought some of the other skin back. Uh, it's really gross. Uh, 
and, and it was awful, and I could barely even walk on it. And I had crutches, and it was hard to even walk on it. That's what disunity is. As gross as you think that feels and sounds, that's what disunity is. Nothing less than that. If anything more, that's disunity. And you feel it in your family. That's what it is. You just think about the flesh separating. Hmm. And the infection that comes in. And the pain when you're trying to walk and you feel like you're walking alone on one less leg. That's disunity. That's not what God has for us. In fact, uh, this idea of, of unity, uh, the word literally means for us to view each other in harmony as soul brothers and sisters. Beautiful is that if we can live in harmony with one another, think about the testimony the world will be able to see when they say, you're just living in harmony. See, Leonard, Leonard Bernstein, who is a great composer, uh, he composed for the Philharmonic, uh, Peter Pan, West Side Story, one of the greatest movies ever. Uh, he was asked, what is the most difficult instrument to play? He thought for a moment, and he said, second fiddle. He said, to get someone to play second fiddle enthusiastically has been one of my most difficult positions to fill. Anyone can play first violin, but to get someone to play second, it's very difficult. And without the second fiddle, we don't have any harmony. That's what it's like to live in disunity. Like something's just missing. This is this idea, we miss it. We have no harmony. But there's character killers that Paul, Paul actually lays out. He says, these are your character killers. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Well, this is hard for us because this is like the importance that we can have for ourselves. Our self-importance becomes our goal, the thing we chase after, becomes a career we go after. I just want to be more important. Maybe that's not our goal. When it comes to living our purpose, maybe that shouldn't be our goal. In fact, this word vain conceit, uh, the Greek word is kenodexia. It literally means empty glory, a worthless desire for glory. It's, it's the same idea as if we were trying to one-up the person around us. Hey, you know, I, I aced that test. Oh, that's great, I aced two tests. Okay, cool. And, and we'll one-up for the weirdest things. I broke my leg. Well, I broke two legs. Why are we happy? Uh, I recently read an arg- article to figure out how you can work with a one-upper. When someone one-ups, you go, you go even lower. When you say, hey, I aced a test, and they say, that's nothing, you go, you're right, it's less than nothing. They go, oh, I don't know what else to say. Like, I, I got a new car, it's a, it's a Toyota, we're pretty excited about it. A Toyota? <laughs> I have a BMW. Toyotas are nothing. You're right, it's less than nothing. Just let them sit in it. They have nothing else to say. Because the one-upper always wants to be better than you. And if you just let them, they'll go, oh, 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 I don't know what else to do. It's this idea of us focusing after the vain conceit and the selfish ambition. It's this appetite for power, for possessions, for prestige. And it's this slow fade that all of a sudden you look back and you realize, oh, didn't he say do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit? Maybe I'm not living in the rest of this passage in 3 and verse 4. It said not looking toward your own interest, but the interest of others, maybe that's where I need to focus on. Maybe that's where I can stop being self-seeking. I can stop these self-seeking motives and behaviors because the truth is every conflict any of us has ever been in has been because of self-seeking motives and behaviors. Every single one. There, there has been no argument that any of us have gotten in and you've been like, you know what, here's your problem. You're too humble. You look out for everyone else. You're unifying. And, you know, here's the thing. You love Jesus in such a way that makes other people really want to love Jesus. And that we're not going to stand for anymore. We've never gotten to that argument. And if you have, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> but all of our arguments come because we are vain and conceited. Think about how, many, how much fewer arguments we would have if we said, you know, I'm going to start looking at the interest of other people. And he continues on. So this is what it should look like. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Renew your mind. The world will tell you to look out for number one, but scripture says, be a servant. And Jesus does it beautifully. So if I want to have the character of Christ in unity, I also should have the character of Christ in humility. Because having the humble mindset of Jesus will change everything around us. It's not just having the, the attitude of Christ, it's having the posture of him. And if you're thinking of humility, uh, we should know humility is, is not just looking down on yourself. It's looking up to other people around you and saying, how can I serve you? 
Imagine what that would look like in your home, in your work, in your relationships. When your spouse asks, can you take out the trash? And you don't say, could you take it out? You say, you know what? I would love to take out the trash for you. Uh, in our house, we have a give and take on the trash. I will take the trash out. Nikki puts a bag in. And it's awesome. Here's how it started, though. It's because she got frustrated because I always forgot to take, put a bag back in the trash. I know I'm not the only one. I saw someone nudge somebody. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I take the trash out, and I'm like, all right, I'm on my way to work. And I usually walk to work, and I throw the trash away, and she'll text me, you forgot to put a trash bag in. So, I, you're right, but I took out the trash, though, you know? Half, halfway good, I guess. Uh, so that's our kind of agreement, that we help each other out in that way. But in your home, if you were more humble, what would that life look like? In your work, if you were more humble, what would that life look like? In your relationships, if we were more humble, looking like Christ, God, make me only and change me only like you can. Do whatever you need to do. You can take everything because it all belongs to you anyways. But what does that humble mindset of Christ Jesus truly look like? Paul goes on in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read a couple more verses, 5 through 11. Verse 5 says, And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Then he goes on, here's exactly what the humble mindset of Jesus looks like. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. If you pause right there. If you were the son of the most high God, sent from heaven to earth, born of a virgin, to live a perfect life. <laughs> Humility? I don't know if that'd be our best quality. We'd be like, <laughs> we'd be the one-upper, but like the holy one-upper? Yeah. <laughs> You know, when I pray, I literally just talk to my dad. I don't know about you. Oh, water? You swim? Cool. I walk on it. Yeah, so that'd be us. That wasn't Jesus, though. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I want to pause right there. Uh, I didn't even think about saying this, but if Jesus needed to be obedient, how much more us? And I know that word obedient sometimes makes us feel a certain way, but if Jesus needed to be obedient, maybe we do too. Verse nine, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To whose glory? Jesus' glory? No, God the Father. Uh, this, this whole idea is one of the most pivotal passages when it comes to the deity of Christ. This is this idea, uh, the word is kenosis. It's, it's this idea that Jesus Christ being God himself, would say, I'm not going to walk in a way that says, I am just God. I'm going to walk in a way that says, I am also human. I am also man. And I'm going to take the place of a servant. Oh. In our teaching team, we were talking about this whole idea and looking at this idea of kenosis being not this identity of subtraction, getting away from who he is as God, but addition of saying, I am the God-man. It's a powerful moment in scripture where you get to see exactly the heart and the mindset of Christ. If we could live like that, we could truly pray as we sing these songs, God, I wanna be more like you. Make me more like Jesus, more of you and less of me. And here's the difficulty. Some of us feel at times that humility is not something we need to work on. And, and even as I was reading this earlier this week and preparing, I felt God speak to me that God will not fill a vessel that is full of themselves. So he says, empty it out. All of the me that I love, I'm thankful for, God, take everything. If that's what you have to do, take everything. And it's a process. This is the whole idea of the renovation that we all need to have, the renovation of our hearts, renovation of our lives. It's this remodeling process. And I know it can get messy. God, do what you will. More of you and less of me. Take everything. 
We read it in, in just these verses. Instead, he, right, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. This is self-giving love that dominates every single relationship. Imagine if self-giving love defined your marriage, defined your home life, defined your work life, defined every relationship that you're in. You would be viewed as someone who is carrying a purpose that is greater than anyone could ever understand. You just want to unify, you just want to love, and you're willing to sacrifice in a way that only Jesus would do. In fact, with these qualities of unity and humility, we have a couple in our church that I wanted to invite up onto the platform, Dan and Dina Stoneman. Can we give them a hand? Now, I'm, I'm so thankful for Dan and Dina. Dan and Dina have been uh, involved in life groups, been serving. You can keep coming over this way a little bit. That way, our people online can be able to see you. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Dan and Dina have served in life groups. They've um, served in tech. Dan, you've done video. You've done editing. Uh, so many different things. But when it comes to this idea of unity and humility, how have you seen it play out in your marriage? Well, it doesn't come naturally to either one of us. We're both sort of type A personalities. And so we've had to be um, intentional about playing second fiddle, actually, and learning to trade off playing second fiddle and humbling yourself to honor, well, for me to honor Dan and what he believes. All of that came to reality when we tried to hang wallpaper together. (laughs) Renovation. For, yeah. First off, we will never do that again. <laughs> and despite the fact that I was like 25 years old and had never hung wallpaper before, I thought I knew all that. And we won't do that again. <laughs> uh, Dan, what about you? I actually had hung wallpaper a half a dozen times, but uh, I obviously didn't know anything about what I was doing. But <laughs> that was early in our marriage. I think um, the, the thing that uh, has happened for me especially with my walk with Jesus Christ, is that as I've let him more into my life, I've become more forgiving and less defensive. And I, I, if there's any secret that I would give anybody, uh, we've been married for 35 years, going on 36. And uh, Come on, give them a hand. It's a miracle she's put up with me that long. <laughs> but I think the thing I do to try to gain forgiveness is to try to do one good thing for her every day, at least. Sometimes I need six things a day. <laughs> yeah. But. Wow. Uh, and, and how long have you both been at Newbreak? We've been here since uh, 2010, so 12, 13 years. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. And, and in that time, you've, uh, I've seen it. Why don't we share with them how you have actually shared this walking as a couple in unity and humility, how have you shared that with people around you? Uh, because 40, how many years again? 35, maybe. 30, 30, 30, he said 36, oh. I don't know. I, okay, 30 plus years, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, 35? In May. 36 in May, gotcha. okay. Uh, with that much wisdom on the platform, and we all clapped because uh, we live in a world where that's very rare that we see a couple staying together that long. We know it's filled with ups and downs and every day is not easy. How do you share living in humility and unity as Mm -hmm. a couple uh, with the people around you? Well, specifically in life groups, um, we do what I call keep it real. So we humble ourselves before the life group, uh, other couples, and we talk about our shortcomings and the things we're still working on. It's not, the life group's not our platform to say, well, you know, I do my devotions every day and I'm all that and whatever. <laughs> it's a place where everyone can be real and we make sure that the space is, is open for other people to be real too and to be humble about where they are and what they do and what they need to work on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that humility. Look at that. that. <laughs> um, uh, you, you both have uh, worked in, uh, in, in the world and done amazing jobs doing that. Um, for those of us that are still on this journey uh, as a couple uh, to become more and more like Christ, how have you seen humility and unity impact your work life as well? So that you go first this time? Yeah. <laughs> I know um, I had worked in a uh, career for 41 years and as time went on, I gained a lot of positional power. And I had a lot of people working for me, and they did stuff for me. 
And I really wasn't able to be a servant leader the way I'd like to. Uh, when I first started out in, in management, I was had smaller groups and I was able to do that more. Uh, and since I've retired, I, I bought some businesses and um, I'm very humble. <laughs> I, I either have to be humble or I have to pay a lot of people a lot of money to do plumbing and all kinds of stuff because yeah. I'm sweeping floors and I'm taking out the trash and I'm cleaning out drains and unclogging toilets and all that. So it's a little easier to be humble. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, m me as well. The job that I have, I'm a director of a, a private school, and it's positional power. So I have to be, because everyone works for me, and I get to make all the rules. And so I have to be very intentional about uh, flipping that pyramid, so not where I'm at the top of the pyramid and everyone down below does all the things that I say, um, but turning that pyramid upside down and knowing that I'm at the bottom and I'm serving everybody and I'm doing everything I can to support what they do. And if you have a second, the height of humility, do I have a second? Oh, yes, Came you have this as much week. time as you need. Um, I'm walking down the preschool hallway and there on the floor, in the middle of the hall, is a pile of poop. There you go. Human or dog or? It is clearly human poop. Okay, all right, just time. And it didn't fall out of somewhere, it was deposited there. <laughs> so, deposited. My, my brain is reeling. I'm like, well, first of all, there was a preschool in the hall, yeah. preschooler in the hall long enough to do that, unattended. That's my first, like, what? Oh, and uh, so the housekeeper is right there as I'm discovering this, and I said, oh my gosh, Juana, will you please clean this up? And she says, what, me? And my director brain is screaming, well, you or me, and it's not going to be me. That's <laughs> my first thought. But I said, okay, okay, I'll do it. And so I turn, and the kitchen's right there. I get some gloves, and I'm fixing to clean up the poop off the floor. And uh, a teacher came out of the classroom, and she had put it there as a joke. It was the little plastic, hard plastic thing. <laughs> oh, wow. So, <laughs> but I held my humility in check, like, okay. I serve, I'm going to clean up this poop. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. I, uh, let's, let's give, wait, before you go, um, your couples group, I think with the many years of wisdom that you have, um, not only in uh, the work field, but also in marriage life, I think there's many of us that could learn from that type of wisdom. So if you could give us when your life group is and what do we need to do to be a part of it? Uh, we had a life group for about 10 years, and then we took a break this last two seasons. Um, but our life group is back. It's on Wednesday nights, and um, you can sign up online uh, to join us. It's called Keeping It Real. Oh, there we go. Well, thank you so much, Dan and Dina. Let's, <laughs> let's give them a hand. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so thankful for them, and, and there's so many of us that have walked through unity and humility and are learning to do it so we can walk in our purpose in that way. I just want to want to share some quick practical habits, um, and then I, I want to end in a way that's going to remind us how to be humble. Uh, habit of humility, number one, is taking the high road. That's not returning insult for insult. That's returning insult with compassion and love and empathy and understanding. Uh, next would be this idea of saying only what builds others up. Don't tear anyone else down. Encourage one another. All throughout scripture we see that. This idea of encouragement, uh, the, the beginning part, the prefix, is this idea of giving. Give courage to somebody. Maybe that's the one thing you can do this week. Give courage to someone. And you may be thinking, but I'm better than them. Well, that's called entitlement. The word entitlement means to give yourself a title. God's the only one who does that. Let's give courage. Not receiving titles just for ourselves, or accepting criticism, criticism well without having to defend yourself. So can someone says, hey, can I give you some feedback? And you're like, no, Jennifer, you give your own feedback. I don't need it. I'm perfect. Uh, there's so many quotes that come to mind, but one of them is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, I view everyone as my superior in that I can learn from them. Uh, that's one of the ways we can walk in humility. Uh, lastly, giving up the need to be right. I know this one feels good. Uh, I, I recently read um, some, some documentation of this man named Ryan Leake, he's a great pastor. He said, there's four words that could transform every room. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And so maybe the prayer is, God, when I'm wrong, teach me to change. And this is the part we have to pay attention to. And God, when I'm right, make me easy to live with. Right? Because we love being right. If we truly live in humility, 
and love for one another, there will be no place for one-upping. There will be no place for empty glory-seeking among God's people because all we care about is Him. Maybe if, like me, you can be, become preoccupied with yourself, I want to take the next few moments in worship because as Eugene Peterson, the author of the message paraphrase, would say it, he'd say, worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves. So Pastor Nate's going to sing a bit more of that song, God, make me more like Jesus. So God, even right now, as we prepare, we want to be more like you. We want to be transformed by you. We want to be made new in you. And God, we just put on the altar anything that disunifies, anything that is pride, anything that pulls us away from you. And we give you permission to do what only you can do. In your name we pray. Amen.